Hi everyone, it's uh, Kevin Raver from PhotoPXL and uh, very excited tonight. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of fun here and do something a little different. I'm joined with my friend Jeff Shiwi and uh, we're going to be talking to Stephen Wilkes tonight. And uh, for all of you that don't know Stephen, you'll get to know him pretty well by the end of this presentation. I first was introduced to Stephen back in early 2000 when he did a presentation at Photo Plus East, and it was on uh, his Ellis Island project that he did. And it's quite a project that he got me hooked on deteriorating interiors and buildings and urban X type photography. Quite a project, so you should definitely look that up. And then he's done a number of other projects since then. And when I was at Phase One, uh, I got to meet Stephen when he started using the Phase One back for his day-to-night project. Quite exciting. And uh, if you haven't looked at that, definitely want to look at that. There will certainly be links in the article that accompanies this. But I don't want to go too far here. What I'm going to do is introduce Stephen and uh, Jeff. And Jeff's going to do most of the driving here tonight, and I'll interject where possible with some questions and everything. But this ought to be real, real fun. And I almost forgot to mention that probably one of the uh, coolest projects that Stephen did that we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit here is his uh, J. Myself project, which um, anybody that knew J. Myself, like all of us did, considered him somewhat a guy sometimes. Stephen was the fortunate guy that got to work with him. He did a marvelous uh, video. It's actually a movie uh, documentary, and uh, so certainly something you need to put on your watch list if you haven't seen it. So, uh, Jeff, take it away, my friend, and let's make this uh, a, a great evening. And Stephen, thanks for being here with us. Thank you so much, Kevin. Great to be here with you both. Are you sure, Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> it won't hurt as much as a colonoscopy, although we are <laughs> going to be looking up into what makes uh, Stephen Wilkes tick. So are you ready for that? Uh, yeah, definitely not ready for the colonoscopy, but <laughs> looking forward to the other part. For those people that may be living in a, uh, a cave somewhere, and have never heard of Stephen Wilkes, uh, I thought it'd be useful to show, first of all, your website. And we'll have links to this in the article um, because I think you're probably going to get some fans, if not stalkers, from this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and wanted to point out, we're going to go through a bunch of stuff, some of it in depth and some of it kind of a little bit more superficial, uh, but obviously we're going to talk about day to night and uh, America in detail in particular, mainly because of the fact that I think that that was, at least in my mind, one of the most impressive um, kind of shocking uh, realizations that fine art digital prints had come to be at that that uh, you could actually create a real good photographic image uh, and print it digitally. Uh, I wanted to point out you have a Facebook page with, I love the, the shot of uh, your headshot that you use. And, and you know, I-, I Greg thought Gorman. Was, <laughs> I know, I thought it was a Greg Gorman because I zoomed great, in- Great, Greg Gorman. Yeah, I checked the uh, catch lights and it was, yeah, that's Greg's catch lights. <laughs> Your Instagram page, which has actually got, I think you actually post photographically kind of maybe more stream of consciousness on Instagram than Facebook. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a little bit more. Um, well, I think, you know, they, they both sort of speak uh, to a little bit different audiences, to be frank. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, Instagram is photo driven more than, yes. than social media necessarily. Exactly. But then you do post to, to uh, Twitter. Um, are you followed by uh, Donald Trump? No. Okay. <laughs> Definitely That's not. A good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good the thing. The other thing I wanted to show was your Vimeo page. And quite honestly, Stephen, there's some stuff there that you've been holding out on the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> for example, the uh, power of a still image. I, I didn't see that before, and it was like, wow, that's really pretty cool. Uh, I like the, the brain dance. Uh, yeah. Then you've got some behind the scenes, some of this we're going to see. Uh, I love the Amazon Fulfillment Center. <laughs> that was a fun project, actually, doing the Amazon um, and photographing all the robots. And, of course, now that's, you know, become really the centerpiece of their business, you know, uh, the fact that they uh, – so much of it is uh, – you know, in terms of how you get a package 
actually is all taken care of by a robot. It's really kind of an amazing thing. But uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, uh, particularly mention is uh, for people, I'll put a link in the story to listen to your TED Talk, because once you've seen the, this presentation and seen the work, I think people would really enjoy uh, seeing your TED Talk. And I got to compliment you. I've seen a lot of TED Talks. Not many uh, artists and photographers did as well, I thought, as you in terms of the cogent, uh, coherent, um, you know, presentation. Well, it's um, very kind of you. Thank you, buddy. I it is that. very kind of me, but it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you're starting like this, I, 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 God knows where this is going to go now. He's, <laughs> oh, oh, man. I only <laughs> have three <laughs> wishes. Yeah. I've used, I think, one or two already. So, uh, no, but the thing is that you've got one advantage that a lot of people don't have is you have really neat images to back up the words. So you could actually just stand up there and say nothing and have a good <laughs> presentation. Tashin, we're going to talk about the book. In fact, I'm going to show the book. Uh, and I'm going to show a different look at the book that you probably haven't seen before, Stephen. One of your wishes come true. <laughs> there you go. I mean, I got Jeff doing a, a serious documentation of day to night. I kind of love that. I started taking pictures of the book. I love it. And I got frustrated and I thought, well, shit, I'm just going to do a, a video of it. So it's a stop motion um, iPhone video. Oh, this is fabulous. Your entire fucking book. <laughs> it, it really it. is an amazing book you know one of the things that i love when i look at this book is you know you see the one day to night picture and then you can see the previous or the, the following pages where you can start looking at one and i remember some of these where you could you could just immerse yourself in the image because there's so much like when some of the stuff where you have people just to see what they're all doing in some of these locations. So I'll send you that, that video. Cause it really Please do Jeff. That looked, that was fantastic, man. I'll, this is a treat to, to share this uh, with you, Jeff um, and, and Kevin, both of you. I know you guys for so many years and it's, it's nice to be able to, uh, to uh, share this whole process of my work. You know, one of the fun things I think when, when I do these things is uh, it forces me to go back in and rethink a lot of the sort of process uh, and the certain moments in my career and work that I've done that um, upon first glance, I may not have made certain connections to. But as I sort of look back now, uh, I see sort of certain moments that really begin to define a certain pathway. And that's why I enjoy doing uh, and talking and sharing this with you guys. Uh, but, that's but this, one of the cool I, things about being a photographer is to to be able to revisit what you've done and get a new appreciation. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so basically this, this show, you know, always for me has always been about how, where I started. And um, the beginning for me was taking photographs through a microscope. Uh, I was very curious about science when I was about 12 years old and I um, took a scientific photography class uh, that involved me taking my first pictures through a mi microscope. And so this was one of those pictures. And I think it just uh, was one of those moments that opened my eyes in a way to seeing the world um, in a completely unique and different way. I think it's the combination of seeing a micro world, an invisible world. Um, it piqued my curiosity, which was is something that I've always been a very curious person. Uh, and, and also I, I, I had a sense of discovery. And I think in a way, metaphorically, this became the roadmap for why I really wanted to uh, be a photographer was because both of those things, you know, the, the act of discovery and curiosity are, are so fed um, through the act of photographing. So I started um, really getting hooked when I was bar mitzvah uh, 13 years old and my uh, twin brother, I have an identical twin brother and Donald, uh, uh, my brother and I posed for a photograph by candlelight and uh, the photographer who took this picture actually became my first men mentor. Um, he owned a, a, a Queens Bridal Center. It was uh, his name. Uh, the center was called Renee Paul, and um, Renee was my mentor. And my mother made a deal with him. Basically, would you be interested in letting Stephen work for you? I, I was so hooked by this photograph. I asked my mom, "Would you drive me and, and help me get so I could learn from this photographer? I wanted to learn from him." And so I would spend every weekend um, learning how to do weddings, bar mitzvahs, special events, uh, assisting, and then eventually, by the time I was fourteen. I was doing my own jobs. And by the time I was 16, I had my own business going. 
Um, so I, uh, this was my first camera I bought. Uh, you know, the, my big investment was a Nikon. Uh, and that was really an exciting time. And who else did I take a picture of but my twin brother? Uh, so I started getting into color for the first time. I started shooting color slide film. This is one of my first roles of color film. And then I just got very fascinated by light and texture. And I think uh, one of the things I've discovered over the years is that as I photograph, there are certain themes that are in my work that actually were essentially the same exact themes. They've just evolved over time. And so, you know, texture and light is something you're seeing. This is a very early photograph I did. My father used to always turn his sprinklers on on the end of the afternoon, uh, late afternoon, right at sunset. So as a kid, I always remember seeing the sunlight going through the sprinklers as they would intersect. And uh, it became a, a fascination for me. I love photographing that. A lot of times I was always say how, you know, you are what you are at the earliest stages of taking pictures. Well, for me, it was, you know, taking a photograph. Here I am in high school. I'm 14 years old in junior high school. And one of my friends drove a car down where, you know, we, everybody gets on the buses. And if you look at this photograph, it's really um, beyond the fact that it's a solarized print and it's a time exposure. What's really happening is there's a single point perspective going on in this photograph. And this is the idea for me that um, it has become almost, if you look at all my work, it's like a staple visually in so many of my photographs is, they, is capturing a single point perspective. As you grow, I think I always feel like you, you look at your work and you say, is there a, a moment where you felt yourself in a picture? This is one of those moments. Um, it's an empty swimming pool ladder that I did in 1980. So for me, a big transformative moment in my life uh, as a photographer was when I created my first body of work. And, and I'm kind of, you know, I think now as I've uh, been doing this for four decades, um, each decade has been uh, a specific bodies of work that I've created, but this was the first time I ever did that. It was in 1979. It was an historic trip to China by Syracuse University, and I decided I had to figure out a way to get on this trip, and so I essentially wrangled um, the School of Visual Performing Arts to basically give me, you know, if they helped me financially to pay for the trip, and I gave them usage of the photographs for three months, and uh, I went to China in 1979, and I created this series of pictures. I'm only going to show you a few of them, but you know, one of the interesting things I think as a measure is, is you know, as a young photographer, I'm, I always say I'm envious of all young photographers because you're so naive, you're so um, untethered by any kind of uh, pressure or what you think is pressure. Um, you know, you, you're not married, you don't have children, you don't have to pay for college. But this, this moment for me was um, a unique moment that was very special. And I think the, the pictures still resonate for me uh, even now. So I was always working with, you know, this is all 35 millimeter uh, natural light. I never had any inkling or I never even understood how to do any kind of lighting. And now we're moving into the next phase, um, which you know this work, Jeff Wells, California One. I, it's my first book on the Pacific Coast Highway. And I had um, the gift of working with a, a great team, uh, the guys who created the Friendly, Friendly Press, they created the Creative Black Book. Terrific guys who had that, headed that organization and they went into publishing. And they ended up uh, coming up with uh, a concept to do art books. And they asked me, would you be interested in doing an art book? And I was like, yeah. And so we started talking and said, what about California? And so the Pacific Coast Highway became the theme. And the only direction I had was to make California look hot, Southern California look hot, and Northern California look cool. So for the first time, I started photographing with a panoramic camera. And it was with this camera that my world began to change because I'd never worked, uh, this camera is a Fuji uh, 617 panoramic camera. And as many of you know, the first time it came out, it was, uh, you know, everybody was doing big landscapes with it. Um, I saw that you could focus uh, pretty close with the camera. And I love the idea of almost creating um, a, a peripheral vision type of experience where I could get close enough to a subject, the person, and maybe have this sort of wide view uh, and so I started to develop my eye and started thinking like that and created a series of, of photographs using this panoramic format. At the same time, I was using 35 millimeters. So when you see the book, it's really almost like a jazz kind of an experience where as you go down the highway, you know, you're, you're glancing out your window like this, and then you stop the car and you get out of the car and then you, you stand and you you know, you take the, the scenery in, it's almost like you can feel your lungs expanding with the clean air that's along the coast highway. I wanted to create sort of a visceral experience for you when you look through my book. And so I used this combination. 
that kind of looks like uh, Southern California now because of the COVID. Desert. Yeah, yeah, isn't it strange how a picture, this was shot, of course, in uh, 1987, uh, would almost be, you know, somewhat prescient now in terms of the way it looks today. And that's that's a shadow of an airplane, right? Yes, yes, that's a shadow. And that's all, by the way, none of, there's no retouching. This is way before Photoshop or anything. This is all in camera. Um, I'm essentially working, you know, like a, it's working with a large format. So I work on a tripod. I even had special glass cut for that camera so that I could really compose my shots like a view camera. So it was a really different way to work. Much later, uh, that camera system actually eventually had a, a plate system, a glass plate you could put into it and you could like a focusing grid. But I actually made my own um, when it first came out because I wanted to work with it that way. And then this, of course, Huntington Beach during the Ocean Pacific Surf Festival. This um, is one of those pictures that uh, I, I talked about earlier where, you know, the, it's an immersive image. You know, you sort of move close to it and you start looking at it and your eye just goes everywhere. It's like, holy cow, look, I mean, there's so much going on and you can see such detail. Yeah, it was, uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, we've seen this picture has been really copied a lot, to be honest. Um, but when I did it, it, nobody had ever seen it before. I mean, I, 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 this was in 87. And I remember when I flew over it, we had one circle pass. Um, I, I had spoken to a sculptor and he said, hey, have you ever seen uh, the Huntington Beach Surf Festival, man? I go, no, I've never been. What's it like? He goes, dude, he goes, 100,000 people on the beach, man. I go, 100,000 people? It was like inconceivable to me. I instantly sort of thought, oh, man, that would be an incredible aerial shot, on t you know, looking down. And, and that's what ended up happening. I just got very lucky when I saw this and we was able to capture it. Uh, this was, we're starting to sort of now move into a point where um, I started to really begin to work commercially. And uh, this was a big, I started doing annual reports. This was the Heinz annual report. I photographed AJ Hackett jumping out of a um, helicopter, bungee jumping. So he actually had a, 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 a cable connected to a chopper and he jumped out at sunrise for me. Uh, and it was, one of those moments, to be honest, where as a photographer, sometimes I, I would could visualize this. This is the first time this happened. I actually visualized this photograph. And when I sat down with AJ, uh, we were having coffee. I said, I understand you jump out of helicopters now. I go, yeah. I said, I've got this crazy idea. Do you think you could jump uh, over an area? There's a pond where the remarkable mountains are in the background. And he goes, actually, that's where I normally do it. I go, well, do you think you could do it for me at like sunrise? And he goes, I'll tell you what, I've got a TV thing. We'll have two choppers. I'll give you five minutes, let you get up there. If you get it, you get it, you don't, you don't. And this is what happened. And Anna, when I, when I was meeting with him, I actually drew a drawing and this was the drawing I drew. I drew the mountains, a single line and him coming down through the clouds. So it was just one of those, what I didn't predict was when his arms would open like this, if you look at the photograph, uh, if you turn the picture upside down in your mind, you'll actually see it looks like, of course, the famous statue of Christ in Rio de Janeiro. So it oh, was yeah, yeah, yeah. just an amazing experience. So that was a big step uh, commercially. Uh, the next thing that really changed my life was I, I did a job for Nike and, and started doing a lot of sports. This was one of the seminal moments I was able to photograph, the, of course, the great Michael Jordan. Getting to meet him and uh, photograph him, this was just the beginning of, the, of his superstardom. Yeah, this was before he became um, a six-time uh, winner. That's correct. That's right. He had not won at that point yet, but he was. He, it, oh, the writing was on the wall, and it, everybody knew what this I, guy was. I photographed yeah. Michael twice. Once for a Gatorade uh, TV commercial where I was shooting stills, and then the, th the second time was when he was. Uh, a right fielder that couldn't hit a curveball for the <laughs> wow. Birmingham Barons. Oh, so you got him in his baseball days too. Huh? I got him. Wow. I have a shot of Michael holding a basketball with a baseball bat on his shoulder in uh, standing on second base. That's you amazing. Gotta you got to appreciate the fact that he thought he could be a baseball player and he did it. <laughs> well, you, you know what? Towards the end, I, I've heard a lot of, you know, I, you could hear it in the documentary. A lot of the guys said he was starting to get the hang of the curveball. I mean, you know, he, he, he's just such a remarkable athlete. He had one of the first um, love of the game contracts. He could play basketball anywhere, anytime, and he was 100% insured uh, so that he could play pickup games or he could play games for, uh, uh, you know, um, for commercials and stuff. Amazing. But 
he loved kids too, and that was the other thing. Well, we casted, these are all real, real high school kids. Can you imagine somebody walking up to you and say, hey, you want to play a pickup game with Michael Jordan yeah, for a Nike right. poster? It was like, and what happened in this picture, um, this is actually that happened. Michael would only stuff three times on an outdoor rim. And so um, they, they're, I don't know very many, uh, they're so rare to see anything of him playing in an actual street ball scene. And so he came out, we had these kids, and one of the kids started talking trash to him the guy with the 33 shorts and Michael just literally did a shake and bake move from the top of the key. And he just took off. And what you see, you see the way everybody's jumping and Michael's already where they're at the peak of their jump. They're just coming to his hip line. Um, he, he actually, when he jumps, what you begin to realize is he actually extends his body at the peak. So he coils like almost like a snake and he jumps, he reaches peak altitude and then he extends his body. And so in essence, it, it just, it appears that he hangs in midair for this inordinate amount of time. But it was, uh, it was, it was incredible. Uh, as soon as you, you know, he's such a competitor, Michael, as soon as he, you know, the kids started talking trash, it was just like, okay. And I got one shot. That was it. I got one like this. And that was, uh, that was the shot we went All with. it takes, just one. So then I, I, at the luck of shooting Andre Agassi, this became kind of an iconic picture of him. Um, uh, that that was uh, again during um, the, his really peak days on the tour. And then you know I, I got other more and more opportunities to shoot celebrities, musicians, uh, Carlos Santana, the great Carlos Santana. And one of the things that started happening for me was I started to experiment a lot in the stage. Even though I was working commercially, I was taking chances. This was a shot I had shot an ad, and I I had my eight by ten camera, and I was doing cross process Polaroids at the time, and I did this portrait of him. I then um, love this idea of experimentation, and I've always been a student of the history of photography. And so I started collecting antique lenses and then using 100-year-old glass with digital backs. I actually had a, um, a special housing built to hold uh, these antique lenses, and I could shoot uh, a high-resolution digital back with a 100-year-old lens. And this was a thing I did for a, a company called uh, Klamath. Uh, it was a big insurance company, and they... Um, wanted me to do create these photographs that look like turn of the century uh, photographs. This picture, I think, uh, you know, people often ask me, Jeff, this is kind of interesting because I've never really spoken about this or shared this. This was an ad I did for AT&T. It was called Singular at the time. And you remember the bars? And they, uh, so this was in Atlanta, uh, the uh, Fulton County Stadium in the dead of winter. I took 150 extras and I recreated a summer baseball game in this photograph. And, you know, when you look at the details in this photograph, everything is there. I mean, the way the empires are communicating to each other, the guys in the bullpen off in the distance, and the 150 extras, I moved them around the entire stadium. That's how I created this entire look and effect. And when I did this, I, I think this was an aha moment for me in terms of electronically about what was possible photographically. I started to really change the way my brain was sort of wired once I was able to create this kind of a storytelling in a single photograph and do it in a way that was this seamless where most people look at this photograph and say, how th th that's not an actual game. How's that even possible? Uh, I started to think about what else could be possible. Well, kind of a precursor to, uh, um, that was, uh, you did a locked camera and, and moved the, the people all around multiple times. Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of a precursor for day to day night. To night. Yeah, exactly right. That's that's really one of the things I when I went back to this image, I realized that this is this was definitely as as physical in terms of being Herculean in terms of what was going on electronically. This is one of those pictures that was just even by any standards, it was way beyond what anybody else was really doing in in the medium at that time. And I was just you know for me, it was just I kept going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole at this point. I then had a chance to photograph Eric Clapton for Rolex. Really an amazing guy. We were supposed to have a half hour and we spent like three or four hours together. And then I got asked to do a really interesting campaign. Somebody came to me and said, if you could be Lewis Hine today, could you go back in time and make pictures like Lewis Hine did? And so I started, you know, again, I was very interested. Again, I had my soft lens collection. I had all this antique queer equipment and I was, I was making these um, photographs that really had this, uh, this quality that was very, very similar to what I think when you think about, you know, 
the, the, the movement in photography, um, the photo succession. And, um, and so I decided I, I was a really, I, I worship Lewis Hine. I mean, he was really one of my all time heroes in photography, not just because of, of the images, obviously the way he saw things, but it was the power that he brought to his photographs and the incredible inspiration and purpose he had in creating his work that really changed the way people viewed um, immigrants and, and, and teen ch child labor, all these things he made such a huge difference in. So uh, I went to, uh, we had an incredible uh, person who uh, did all my uh, styling on this. This was uh, literally a, a, a series of pictures that I did in a parking lot on a white backdrop um, with my turn of the century camera. And then we actually went out to Ellis Island and I photographed backgrounds. And then even the texture you're seeing on this photo, in these photographs is something surface wise that I photographed separately. And these, all these elements were brought together to, to tell these stories. Uh, and it was, uh, a, the company was called State Street. What was the uh, date time frame for this, Stephen? Uh, this was done uh, in the 90s, yeah. And this is using an antique, uh, I actually used, um, so some of the shots are done uh, with the camera mounted, the antique lens is mounted to a digital back. Other stuff is mounted directly to a Type 55 camera, and then we tone the work accordingly. But this was shot like in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where, uh, of course, I very close to where I live, and it was also one of the great you know, industrial areas in the turn of the century. And so I was able to find a building that actually looked the part. And we brought everything in from the, the pumping water. That's, all that stuff is actually brought in. Um, it, was, it was really an extraordinary uh, production to get it to look like this. But if you saw what was the behind the scenes, you wouldn't have believed it. But I think that's what I love about the challenges when I did commercial work was I love solving problems, but I also uh, love to go into um, the world and really try to think about, you know, when I was, you know, I was trying to channel Lewis Hine. I was thinking about the things he would have been drawn to and the way he photographed and the way the light falls and all the things that you think about when you photograph. Um, especially when you dial into a specific time period. So then I started doing, um, you know, some editorial advertising. This was a campaign I did for the New Yorker. Uh, again, you can begin to see that this is a very complex photograph to do where you have, look how many people are in this picture and they're all reading um, the New Yorker. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, you can see them all the way from the front to the back. And, uh, you know, when you do a picture like this, we, we shot in the subway museum which was always uh, kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, but you only have a certain limit of time, about three hours to do a picture like this. So this was quite a, a challenging, but very rewarding project to finish and execute. Uh, a lot, I started discovering that a lot of my personal photographs started to inspire commercial jobs. Uh, again, the New Yorkers saw the aerial of the beach that we spoke about earlier. And they said, could you do that with everybody reading, you know, a New Yorker magazine? So I said, well, I'd, I'd have to get in a crane for that. And that's what I ended up doing uh, over Jones Beach. And this was really a challenging picture because, you know, to get close enough to see and read The New Yorker uh, and still capture all of, you know, the sort of natural magic that, that happens within a normal beach day uh, was really something that, you know, I, I think on the, uh, when an art director draws something, it looks one way, but when you get out in location and actually have to deal with scale, it's something else entirely. It really is a matter of picture in picture, which yeah. is also a precursor. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, in the end, you know, I think what, one of the things you see is, uh, and I speak about this all the time, is that if you don't have the, the mastery of analog, you can't go into digital and do the same. You know what I mean? It's by having a certain craft when you start out as a photographer, that ability gives you um, such a gift when you go into digital because suddenly everything opens up to you and you're not thinking about technique anymore. You're being able to, you know, suddenly you can really explore these tools because you're not worried about whether you're going to hit the exposure or not, or the, or the picture is going to be in focus. So this is Stranger Things. I had the, the great honor to do the uh, season two poster. And, um, you know, these are all done on location, um, uh, actually in Atlanta. And we're um, photographing with, you know, hot lights and, uh, you know, doing um, really some really neat things. A beautiful shot. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I go on location and I get the, the, the honor to work with a lot of the set dressers, the actual team that works on uh, on Stranger. And, and Stranger is just a remarkable, uh, from Netflix side, the marketing uh, is just extraordinary. And, and, and the entire team behind Stranger, the Duffer brothers, 
uh, the entire cast and crew, everybody is just, it's like a family. And it's really a, been a special uh, journey for me to be, um, to, to have a window into their world and to be able to, you know, really um, create these images that celebrate them. And it's quite a world they came up with too, isn't it? It's just. <laughs> it is a fantastic escape. Um, uh, it's something we're all looking forward to season four. Uh, so I'm sure. Uh, and then I did these posters um, and this was really neat. These are the, all the, uh, the kids, uh, of course, the main characters. And I actually did some video, which I was hoping to share with you guys. I might be able to get that to get a copy of that to share with you because the video of these is really cool. So I shot stills and film of these, uh, of all the talent. And here's uh, season, season three's poster. So that takes me to editorial. And, uh, you know, editorial has become a very important part of my career. One of the things that's been interesting is that as an editorial photographer, I have been asked to do some very challenging and very, um, uh, you know, not your typical editorial execution. Um, this was something I did, uh, I photographed um, in China uh, and I was uh, documenting um, some water pollution, things that are going on there for Vanity Fair. This was uh, really the beginning, the China work was the beginning of some of the investigative work I've been doing. And then this really became probably one of the most difficult and challenging assignments of my career, actually photographing the Bernard Madoff story when Madoff, um, you know, turned the world on its head um, by announcing that he was running the largest Ponzi scheme in, in, in global history. Um, and the entire scheme took place on the 17th floor. And yours truly was able to get access to someone who happened to be an attorney on the 16th floor. He got me into the building. I smuggled in a, um, a camera uh, under my trench coat. He told me he would meet me. Um, actually, it was the 19th floor, forgive me, not 16. And uh, he said, come up to 19. I went up to 19. He greeted me and he said, as far as you're concerned, this never happened, right? I go, right, right. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Bye. I walk back in the elevator. I hit 17 because that's the picture I want to take. 17 won't light up. Suddenly, elevator goes down and slowly I realize I'm going to the ground floor. And I know there are cameras inside. I've been, you know, I studied when I walk into a building like this, I notice the guard, I notice the TV screens, I see what's going on. And I'm thinking, oh man, they're never gonna let me go back up here again. And all of a sudden at about the fifth floor, the elevator begins to slow and stops. And in walks a guy, he's got his Blackberry in his hand. He's not even looking at me. He takes his wallet out, a white card goes across the top and he hits 17. And he just glances at me for a second and I look at him like nothing. And I start to unzip my jacket. Elevator goes up all the way up. And it, as it's the beginning to hit ding and it hits 17, I take out my camera, 15 millimeter lens, shoot three frames. It was like a bird flew in and out. The guy looked around, didn't know what happened. My coat was zipped. Everything was done. I went straight down to one. I knew I had the opener for the photograph. That <laughs> oh, was it. God. What a story. That is a true story. Wow. When I got to this picture, this is the last night Bernie Madoff stayed in his apartment and the lights are on. Um, I actually had to bribe a hotel, uh, not a hotel, it was a, a condo, uh, the main doorman in a condo. I said, if you know anybody who has a view looking this way, I didn't tell him what it was for. Because <laughs> anytime I said the word Madoff, everybody said, no, thank you. No, thank you. I'm not involved. I'm not involved. And I was able to get access uh, to this one apartment window and it had this view, if you can believe that. That's their rooftop. In cases like this, would you rather be good or lucky or both? You gotta be both, man, in a way. I mean, <laughs> I know, honestly, I know, but yeah, but no, I, I think you gotta be lucky. You gotta be lucky. I mean, but sometimes you make your own luck. Yeah, I mean, you know, I when I did these pictures, uh, you know, I, I never was, quote, like, I never looked at myself that way as somebody who's going to be doing the real undercover kind of stuff like that. I just didn't, but, I, you know, I'm a problem solver. That's kind of what I do. And I'm a storyteller. And uh, I had, you know, real interest in telling this story because I thought it was misrepresented by a mainstream media in general. So um, I had done a bunch of interviews with survivors. I had, I had a lot of insight into what was going on. Uh, I worked with Mark Seal, who was the writer for Vanity Fair, very closely. And when they came to me and they said, look, Ruth is going to be spending the last weekend in her apartment. We need a picture of Ruth. Do you think you can get one? And I had, I said, well, how, how am I going to do that? I know there were, they have, every newspaper guy was staked out in front of her apartment building, waiting for her to come outside, take a cab, anywhere they could see her. And I looked at it, I said, well, the only chance I've got is if I get on a roof and maybe I could peer into a window. And I... Um, 
I set up, uh, I had a, a, one of my, my, my wife's uh, cousin is a young guy. He was great. And he's, I said to him, listen, I've got a job for you. You're going to stand in front of this building. And I knew the building had the right altitude and right. If I got on the right side of the building, viewing wise, I had a view into Madoff's apartment. And I said, you're going to wait here and ask any person who comes out if they have a view looking to the east. Uh, and you're not going to, you're going to say that this photographer does this crazy thing called day to night and he said, you know, just whatever. And so I did this thing and he got this lovely woman who came out and she's, um, she looked at him. She goes, you're so nice. She pinches his cheek and she goes, well, do you have, what, what floor are you at? She goes, come on up. I'm on, uh, I'm on 25. He goes, 25. What well, we were thinking like maybe 16 or 17 would be perfect, but 25 might be okay. So he goes up, I get a phone call and he says, Oh my God, you're not going to believe this, Stephen. We're looking straight down into the window. I can see it. So I go, okay, great. So we pay her a location fee. I come up there with a, literally I have an 1800 millimeter lens and my camera. And she goes, like, it was, it was, <laughs> it was <laughs> honestly, it was her reaction. She looked at it and she goes, my, what a big lens you have. And I said, yes, yes, I do this crazy thing. You see, I shoot all these little pictures and then we seam them all together electronically and it becomes a very, very big picture. And so, you know, I just, I'm just saying, you know, the less she knows, the better, right? So um, meanwhile, I actually am lowering this thing in to give you an idea how far away I am to this shot. You cannot see this window with your naked eye. That's how far away I am in this picture. Okay. So this is an 1800 millimeter uh, view of Ruth Madoff in the only window that's open in the entire apartment. Every other window has a shade closed. And so um, I was able to make this photograph. And um, Susan White, who was the photo, photo editor of Vanity Fair for many years, always said to me, she said, Stephen, you know, for all the sign work I've done, uh, I've ever worked with, your photograph of Ruth Madoff is by far my favorite. So that was pretty special. Yeah. So they hired me again. Uh, uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn was uh, being accused by a, a, of rape by a, a, a woman who worked in the, the Helmsley, I believe it was. And so they said, we want to, you know, they put him under house arrest. It's a very nice house arrest to be put in a townhouse like that. Um, they said, do you think you could get a picture of him? And so, you know, I had literally all kinds of special equipment, um, night vision, you name it. I had it to try to get an angle. And what ended up happening was I had gotten on a rooftop and I had a view in and, um, uh, he had private, uh, security people on the roof and they spotted me. Uh, and so they literally closed, I was shooting pictures through a skylight, if you can believe that. I was actually going to try to photograph him through a skylight. And uh, they, they basically eliminated it. They took it away. And so I regrouped and I thought, you know, uh, at about sunset, uh, all the crowds, the, you know, it becomes a media frenzy during the day. And then it seemed like at sunset, nobody, everybody left. So one afternoon, I always loved the light down there at sunset. And I came by and it was like, suddenly I realized this is a great picture. Like the, the New York City detective is, is to the right there. He's smoking a cigar. And this other kid, somebody just walked by, was just hanging out in, the, in a stairwell. And it, it reminded me, you know, of a Hopper painting almost. And uh, after I took this picture, the detective uh, who worked on the case, he was the lead detective on the case, walked over to me to see what I was doing. And he goes, dude, he goes, that is such a cool picture. And I sent him a print. <laughs> so it was a, a, good, a good move. And Vanity Fair ran this and it, you know, it was a pretty, pretty um, loved image. It's another one I did. Uh, they, they sent me to photograph the F-50, uh, which is um, one of the great debacles uh, in terms of uh, when it was built. Uh, I made this picture from a cherry picker and actually um, had, uh, had the writer on the story was screaming at me saying, you, you have to get down, you have to get down. I go, what's wrong? He said, something's very wrong. I said, what? So I rush, I shoot the picture, I get down. He said, this plane, the, the actual skin of the plane is ignitable if you stay more than 30 minutes in sunlight with it. Uh, I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, it's combustible. It'll actually explode. Crazy. Time Magazine. And then the New York Times Magazine, I've done a bunch of work with, which uh, this is all shot in camera. The great Kathy Ryan at the New York Times uh, commissioned me to do this. Uh, this is the Momix Dance Company. And we actually used the dancers, had them dressed in costume. And then I actually dressed them in black and they created uh, the head and the shape of a head. And we had the great Christoph Neiman did the outline for me uh, to create this shape. But it's all done in camera. There's no retouching to any of this work. 
Then they asked me to photograph uh, a, a mammoth uh, in Vancouver to make it look alive. And then I shot uh, the great Paul McCarthy, uh, the artist Paul McCarthy, uh, who's been fascinated with Disney-esque in all his work. Uh, uh, and, and this is him as uh, Walt Disney. He calls himself Walt Paul. And here he is, Walt Paul, dropping his pants uh, during our session. And then that brings me to Ellis Island. Um, and Ellis was really, for me, uh, a benchmark in my own personal work. Um, you know, it, it was, I've always tried to create photographs uh, over the last four decades. I'd always make time to do personal work. And Ellis um, started as an assignment and actually became this very, very rich and transformative per, uh, personal project. So I was supposed to go out and photograph Ellis Island. Um, I got a phone call from Bob Ciano. There's the book. Yeah, you guys can, if you can find it, it's uh, currently out of print, but we are going to another printing. Um, well, so it's I, in the works. I, I bought it used and it's yeah. in really good condition. Good. It doesn't have your name in there. Well, I'll have to sign I'll that have to have you, my you friend. Autograph it. I will be my pleasure. Um, so anyway, I ended up going out and uh, uh, for what was supposed to be a two hour assignment. Uh, and I, uh, photographed and fell in love and was smitten with Ellis Island and ended up spending five years documenting it. We, um, I ended up working with the New York Landmark Conservancy and we created a video so they could present it to Congress and we raised six and a half million dollars to stabilize it as a living ruin. But in doing that, it, um, it changed the way it looked forever. So these pictures really are history. It does not look like this anymore, unfortunately. All of the detriment has been removed, the windows have been closed, and um, uh, sometimes stabilization can be a form of sterilization. And that was the unfortunate part of what I felt happened on the island. Don't mean to interrupt, Stephen, but when you walked in that place the first time, like I said, this is what, this is the thing that really got me to understand your work and so forth. But you, you didn't know what to really expect when you got there. And when you got there, what happened? What was the feelings that you had when, when you saw this the first time? Well, I, I uh, you know, I, I started as a street photographer and, uh, you know, I, I had this internal, I think all street photographers have an instinct. You can sense things, you know, you can feel things before you even take a picture. You know, when somebody's comfortable being photographed, you know, when somebody is uncomfortable, you can read their energy, you can feel it. It's like a hunter's instinct almost. And I found when I'd go into these hallways and these empty rooms, I was feeling that kind of human energy. But there, of course, no people were around me. There was nothing there except these empty uh, hallways that had this extraordinary light and this extraordinary color. There was lead paint on the walls, but there was this palpable sense of humanity that I felt in every room. I remember walking into this room and I literally walked in the moment that the sunlight was hitting the shoe. Turns out it lasts for five minutes between 315 and 320. And after that, if you walk in at 310, you don't see it. If you walk in at 321, you don't see it. So you have to be there to see that light. The act of, the, of discovery and the act of photographing was almost really simultaneous for me. And that happens sometimes, but not almost on every picture. But on Ellis Island, it was almost on every picture. It was almost as if I was being guided by, uh, by someone through the entire experience. Um, I, I felt this human energy that I, I describe. I, I, you know, I'm not a ghost person, but I started to appreciate the idea that there was history in the light in these empty rooms, that there was a palpable sense of humanity in everything I was photographing. And when I would look at the pictures, at certain moments, I would feel that when I looked at one of my photographs. And that became you know, really the benchmark. Could I make every image on Ellis have that kind of connection, that kind of sense of human energy in it? And that's what I ended up trying to do. And that's what the book really is. It's a collection of all those images that I think in many ways, and as people have written to me for the last many years, you know, the book came out in 2007 and people still write me letters saying they can feel their ancestors in my photographs. Again, it's lead paint. I had to wear a respirator. I had to, um, I was exposed to asbestos, lead paint, bird droppings. This was a very challenging place to photograph. You, you don't even know it's there when you're on Ellis Island though, do you? No, no, it's a hidden side. It's called the forgotten side, Kevin. And the reason it's forgotten is because it was the largest infectious disease hospital in the world when it was built in 1907. Uh, it essentially, they left in 1954, the government did, with the windows open. And so it just started to grow with vines and bushes and trees. And, you know, and you pull up by boat, 
to get off and look at what everybody thinks is just Ellis Island, which is, of course, the Great Hall. But there's actually three islands on Ellis Island. The Great Hall is Island 1, but there's Islands 2 and 3, and that's the Infectious Disease Hospital and the Mental Hospital, the Psychiatric Hospital. And that's what I photographed in Ellis Island, Ghosts of Freedom. So it was those two areas. They were actually created by landfill uh, with, the, with the, the rock that was used to build the Lincoln and Holland Tunnel, the stone that was removed uh, to build those tunnels, actually is the landfill that was used in Islands 2 and 3 to create uh, the south side of Ellis Island. This is, of course, is a tuberculosis ward. And that's a reflection uh, in a mirror uh, that I, I can't tell you. Every time I came into this area, I got drawn in one afternoon. Um, and I remember vividly, I was uh, staring down low and I was looking at dead leaves and you know paint chips on the floor. And I slowly picked my head up at about five feet tall. And exactly at, at that height, I see a perfect reflection of the Statue of Liberty reflecting in that mirror. And believe me when I tell you, there is no way you ever see that unless you were bent over at five feet tall and slowly picked your head up and looked at it that way because it, it is too fast and you have to be exactly at the right angle of reflection to capture it. And it was one of those moments that I'll never forget because I instantly had this almost a, a physical um, a feeling over my body of, of, a, of an Eastern European woman uh, who was in this ward. This is where she lived and where she probably died. And every time she got out of bed, that's as close as she ever got to freedom, was looking at that reflection of the statue. Good, lucky, and, and with the right camera and the right time, I mean, everything worked. Yeah, out. you know, it's interesting you say that. I always say this to the photographers that there is, there's that intersection, Jeff, and you know this as well as anybody. And so do you, Kevin is, is that there's a moments in your life where you photograph something and you go and five, 10 years later, you go, Oh, geez, I wish I could have done that again today. I know so much more, you know, I, I'm so much more adept. Ellis came into my life when, you know, I'd never done architecture photography before, but I, I had learned about the four by five well enough. I felt like I was competent enough technically to execute on it. And I actually developed, you know, a zone system for this. So many people look at this work and they think, well, you're definitely retouching that. I mean, how do you hold the shadows and the highlights? Well, it's a zone system. I actually created a zone system for transparency film to create these photographs. So it, again, uh, when people look at my day to night work, they think, well, you know, it's, you're doing all this stuff, but truthfully, I could never do day to night had I not done Ellis because Ellis forced me to a level of mastery in terms of craft that enabled me to get to a place when I got into digital photography, I wasn't interested in making these kind of pictures anymore. I wanted to really see if I could push the medium outward in a way and change the way we look at a single photograph. 